Welcome to the Sports Docs Podcast with Dr. Katherine Logan and Dr. Ashley Bassett. On each episode, we chat about the most recent developments in sports medicine and dissect through all the noise so you know which literature should actually impact your practice. We want to thank you all so much for listening to our show over the last two years. We have a lot of exciting episodes to kick off our third year, so remember to subscribe if you haven't already. On today's episode, we're focusing on rehabilitation of the lower extremity after orthopedic surgery with Candace Townley Cox, a doctor of physical therapy and body movement expert at Evolution Physical Therapy. Today's discussion will center around tips and tricks to optimize outcomes and some common pitfalls that may hold patients back from a full recovery. We have some really great articles for you that contribute well to our conversation on this topic. As always, links to all the papers that we discuss on the show can be found on the podcast website. The first article is a level three case control study published in the October 2020 issue of OJSM titled Anterior Knee Pain After Anterior Cruciate Ligament Reconstruction. Gustavo Constantino de Campos and his team in Sao Paulo, Brazil, retrospectively reviewed the records of 438 patients who underwent ACL reconstruction. Anterior knee pain was reported in 6.2% of the cases. Patients who underwent ACL reconstruction with a patellar tendon autograph were 3.4 times more likely to experience anterior knee pain. Also, patients who experienced an extension deficit in the post-op period were also more likely to experience anterior knee pain, with an odds ratio of 5.3. The authors found that anterior knee pain was not correlated with patient sex, age, or surgical technique. We're joined today by a special guest, Dr. Candice Townley-Cox. Candace is a Colorado native who received her bachelor's degree in athletic training at Nebraska Wesleyan University, where she was also a student athlete and played varsity basketball. Following undergrad, Candace returned to Colorado as a graduate assistant athletic trainer at Regis University in Denver. There, she earned her master's degree in sport performance while working specifically with the women's volleyball and softball teams. Candace continued her education at Regis University, earning a doctorate of physical therapy. Since graduating, Candace has spent countless hours in sports science labs assessing movement quality, efficiency, as well as bone and muscle performance. As a movement expert, she's able to address the body's impairments from both a table assessment and from functional movement assessments as well. Welcome to the show, Candace. We thought we would just kick off with our all-time favorite topic on the show, which is ACL injuries. Um, We specifically want to focus on the rehab of ACL reconstruction. So our first paper that we talked about at the start of this episode talks about anterior knee pain after ACL reconstruction, which is a real concern for our patients. Um, This paper concluded anterior knee pain was reported in roughly 6% of cases, but many papers suggest this prevalence is much higher, occurring in about one in five patients. So in your experience treating so many patients after ACL reconstruction, do you find that graft choice contributes to the development of anterior knee pain after ACL reconstruction? Yeah, I think that that is a great question. And I absolutely do find um, a lot of correlation between a lot of the patellar tendon grafts and that anterior knee pain. I know the study highlighted that a lot of the hamstring grafts had a decreased prevalence of that pain. But yeah, to this day, even if I get an individual that maybe ACL reconstruction surgery is a part of their history and maybe they had it years ago, if they had that patellar tendon graft, then um, I can almost bet that they have pain with kneeling. Um, And that is part of my history intake and gathering some of that information. And I do see that uh, quite a bit. Um, So I think I'm probably going to sidebar like right away, which I apologize in advance, just because you made me think of something. So you've sort of, Candice, changed my tune a little bit about um, what to do with like kneeling pain. Um, And I used to sort of be of the school, like an older school of thought, which like you kind of just wait and you wait it out and eventually it'll start to get better. And it's just going to take more time where your thought process is like, no, you should do it a little bit like, um, you know, sort of uh, short duration increments but often Mm -hmm. and increase the frequency and use like sort of a yoga foam mat or um, like those blocks, um, the soft ones or rolling your yoga mat, whatever it might be, just get that soft surface and um, like having a little time there. Would you also do the same thing if it was like a more chronic sort of kneeling issue? Like this person had their ACL before. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think that there's something to be said about finding a nice level of kneeling tolerance. And that's to be said, you want to dose it properly, right? So if I have an individual that had ACL surgery 10 plus years ago and they tell me they never kneel, and you know, I've had different scenarios for different people. I had, you know, a mother that wanted to start braiding her child's hair and that involved her kneeling on her knees and this was uncomfortable for her. So starting out in smaller increments, getting a foam pad, I think that finding the kneel, the correct dosage for tolerance is important because you don't want to shoot from the hip and immediately have them doing, you know, 20 minutes a day on a hard surface. I also like to reassure patients and let them know that not many people like just kneeling on a hard floor. That doesn't feel good for anybody. And I'll get patients all the time that are like, well, I can't, I can't kneel on a hard floor unless I have something soft under my knee. And I kind of joke with them. Yeah, same. Me, me either. (laughs) Uh, That's okay. (laughs) And sometimes it starts with uh, for some of those patients where it's really chronic, it might involve us taking like a really rough towel and kind of rubbing the anterior knee and getting some of that desensitization to the scar so it's not as irritated when it does meet the yoga mat. So um, yeah, absolutely. I am going to work with the kneeling tolerance for those chronic patients. So I have a question for for both of you, actually, but Candace, I'll start with you. So with kneeling, um, I've heard in some discussions that the where the incision is sometimes can impact kneeling pain. Um, and so I know some people will try to make the incision more like anteromedial, like not directly over the midline, so that when people are kneeling, they're not kneeling directly on it. But part of me thinks that a lot of the kneeling pain comes from the fact that we take a piece of bone from the patella as well too. And that can lead to some cartilage wearing. Do you see any difference in like size of incision or or positioning of incision in terms of people developing that kneeling pain? Or do you feel like it's more the kind of the changes that are going on deeper below the surface? I think it's more of the changes going on deeper below the surface. I haven't paid enough attention, to be honest, with the kneeling pain to look at exactly right where their scar is at and find a Mm -hmm correlation between, you know, while these individuals with it more anterior medially um, aren't having as much pain as those with the incision right on the anterior surface of the knee. Um, But that is, that is a good question. I think the biggest thing is treating the knee um, and both those scars accordingly. So still doing the kneeling tolerance and then seeing perhaps sometimes it's the scar tissue that's under the knee that's really bothering it. So I may have an individual come in for a cupping session where we are doing a lot of scar massage before we immediately start kneeling on that knee. Yeah, Candice, can you um, elucidate on that? Because I've seen you do that. I've seen it. So in my clinic, we do have um, dry needling and cupping and things like that. Um, so can you explain like how sometimes where that scar is like adhesed or that incision is sort of adhesed down in that technique that um, I've seen you do? Yeah. So one of the reasons I love cupping, I love all manual therapy and I do really love and find it to be important to really work on soft tissue quality, but I find cupping to be unique because it is targeting the problematic area, but in a different way, instead of, you know, really digging down into the muscle and really doing a deep tissue massage, I'm taking each one of the layers of muscle and skin and I'm separating those. You know, when you get down to it, the skin, Each muscle has its own encasing and each artery, nerve, and vein has its own nice, you know, encasing around it. And that can all get really sticky and really bogged down on top of scar tissue, on top of uh, skin adhesions. So I love to put the cups over the muscle, over the scar, and separate all those layers and then have the athlete move their knee and kind of go through some mobilizations with movement with those cups on there. And I find that to be incredibly powerful for scar tissue, mobility, and just overall um, feeling more fluidity with movement. Yeah. That's awesome. And I feel like you mentioned scar tissue and restricted mobility, specifically restricted patellar mobility, restricted mobility of the kneecap has been shown to correlate with anterior knee pain. So how do you specifically address patellar mobility after knee surgery, specifically after ACL? 
Yeah, I think a big part of it, first of all, you know, as a physical therapist, I'm getting my hands in there and I am doing some patellar mobilizations, you know, medial and lateral and inferior and superior mobilizations. But I think having the individual move their knee, engaging in quad sets, walking with a proper gait pattern, that's also going to facilitate proper patellar mobility as well. So really getting them on their rehab plan is going to um, adequately move that patella in a positive way. And it's those individuals that don't execute that plan that we do see have a lot more repercussions with that patellar hypomobility, limiting them in various aspects of their rehab. Yeah, I think that was a really big um, emphasis for like during my fellowship. Um, so Dr. Studman um, was really big on patella mobility. So he spent a lot of time because he created, you know, all these like sort of physical therapy protocols and a lot of sort of early stage things decades ago and understanding, you know, where, um, how things should be going early, like ACL rehab. And he, so he was a big proponent of patella mobility. And then the other thing that um, I would say LaProd spent a lot of time in fellowship sort of honing for us and making sure we really understood was spending a lot of time making sure like when we do ACL sur surgery, cleaning up the adhesions of the patellofemoral compartment. So I think sometimes um, in like, <laughs> Canis, like basically when we're, you know, kind of going in and it's just like a straightforward ACL surgery, I'll put the scope in and, you know, you're up in the patella femoral compartment, you're looking at the cartilage under the patella and then the trochlear groove. And, you know, if a young, you know, sort of athlete, it's generally going to look pretty good. And it's very easy to just sort of be like, okay, let me just go to the ACL because that's what we're here for. And then, but a lot of times they just develop a lot of adhesions up there after the injury. And LaProd was always really big on like, you got to clean that up. Otherwise they're going to have a hard time in rehab. And it's like, it doesn't always seem that important, you know, cause you just think, oh yeah, they have a lot of swelling in there and it, it looks traumatic in the knee put after you have an ACL injury. Um, but I do think like that's another part on the surgical side that if we don't do that, or since I'm doing um, quad graft a lot, if I, after my quad repair, I'm not making sure like if I don't spend a lot of time looking for adhesions, then I know that after surgery, I'm just making it harder for you. <laughs> so yeah. I have to, you know, so I think there, there is, it has to have a lot of attention because there's a lot of downside to not um, sort of getting those little details that seem so basic. People are so focused on flexion and extension. And that little bit really just feeds into, like you said, how they're walking and, you know, how they're, how they're moving. Totally. Yeah, Catherine, I think you really hit the nail on the head there. I feel like if we've ever scoped a knee that has arthrofibrosis after a major knee surgery, you get in that, that super patellar space and there's just like, I, I explained it like cobwebs mm -hmm. just hanging down from the super patellar pouch, just adhering to the, the trochlea and to the, the lateral and medial gutter. And it's just, there's, there's no hope of mobility with that if those thick adhesions start. So I, I think you make a good point that you clean them out and then our PTs have to maintain that space, you know, prevent those adhesions from reforming. So it's like a two-part approach. Yeah. Um, Candice, do you think for that, the voodoo floss has any like utility or you don't really use that early? I don't use voodoo floss okay. too early until the scar can um, is allowed to be mobilized. Okay. Um, but I do love voodoo floss and I will use that with cupping. Same thing with cupping. I won't cup if obviously the scar is not looking to be in a good position. I won't normally cup or use voodoo floss uh, for about eight weeks. But for those that don't know what Voodoo Floss is, it's one of my most favorite uh, modalities and tools that I'll use in the clinic. It's this like thick rubbery um, band. It's, it's almost like TheraBand, but a little bit thicker and it's two inches wide. And I tell people it's called Voodoo Floss and I didn't name it. People just tend to feel better after mm -hmm. it. And it does three things. And what I'll do is I take it and I wrap it um, pretty tight from up right around the knee joint, from below the knee joint all the way up towards the heart, and it'll end up being above the knee joint. And then same thing, I'm a big fan of mobilizations with movement. So I'm going to have the individual start bending their knee. They may even do some squats with it or just some basic heel slides. And what that's doing, it's doing three different things. And it depends on what this individual has going on on why I might be using it. But I like to educate everybody on the, the three things it's doing. 
first thing it's doing is we're going to occlude the area of blood flow. So I like to tell individuals, think about what happens when we put our head underwater for a long time and we deprive ourselves of oxygen. Well, I'm trying to do that to your knee joint. I'm trying to occlude blood flow because for probably about a minute, minute and a half while they're moving their knee. Because when I take that band off, they're going to get an influx of blood flow. So they're going to get an influx of oxygen healing properties. And think about what we do when we come up for air. We (gasps) gobble up all that oxygen. Well, I need your knee to do that exact same thing is what I tell those individuals. And then same thing. Second thing it's doing, it's taking any swelling that's in the joint. I'm really compressing the area. And through that movement, we're pumping that swelling back through the lymphatic system and getting rid of some swelling. And then my favorite piece of it that it helps a lot of individuals with the sliding tissue properties. So very similar to what I said with cupping, we have so many different muscles. You know, we got four quad muscles, three hamstring muscles, tons of lower shin calf muscles, and those can all get real sticky and really bogged down. And we get individuals, and I normally see this about the six months post ACL where they're doing a lot more. They're ideally they're jumping, they're running, they're getting back into activity, but their knee just still feels stiff. They have full range of motion, but it still feels sticky. Well, I'll put that voodoo floss on and it really helps kind of get some of that stickiness out of the way and mobilizes that scar as well. Um, so all those three things combined, people love it. It's it's one of my big go-tos um, if I'm running into a, a wall with any athlete when it comes to fluidity of movement, scar tissue uh, buildup, or really just looking to perfuse the area a bit more. Ashley, have you used this ever on yourself? Yeah, it's try. so funny because as she was talking about it, I'm remembering that therapeutic modalities video that we did for AOS back when we were residents. Do you remember that? And I was the one subjected to it all. I had the cups applied to me for cupping. I had the voodoo tape applied. Um, what else did we do? BFR wasn't around at that point, but I was the person that did all of the things. So I actually did try voodoo tape ones. I'm like, can you be in the photos? Can you do the talking? Exactly. And I did. And I think it worked out well. (laughs) We published an article when we were in residency. So this was a while ago. And it was like in our sort of, it's called our yellow journal of um, AOS, like our um, academy. And they're like sort of review articles. They're not new studies. It's sort of like, hey, here's like the review of X, Y, or Z. And we um, published one on like all the different modalities because generally in orthopedic surgery, you don't get any of that training during residency. So we published a paper on like what's ultrasound, what's e-stem, what's, you know, all that kind of stuff. And is there any data behind it? Um, But we made, (laughs) or I made, I should say, I should (laughs) actually be like the model. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) It was good. I got to learn all about those, uh, all about those different modalities. Cause I feel like as residency, we don't get a lot of exposure to that. Like even now in, in private practice, I have to seek out my PTs and really learn from them. And I'm not just saying that cause you're a PT and on our, and our guest today, I, I really do. I learned so much from them and you know, it's, I laugh at sometimes in the beginning of my practice when I would just write like eval and treat. Yeah. On like on the PT prescriptions now, I actually like know what to write, kind of like what to stimulate in terms of getting them to, to do the best thing for my patients. So, um, so that was, it was a good good intro to it, Catherine. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. So we awesome. really got off track a little bit, but so I'm gonna <laughs> back. Um, so we were talking about anterior knee pain and graft choice. So I think we sort mm-hmm. of talked about patella tendon at least historically in the data that tends to have more of it. Um, and we're trying to figure out why is it something to do with the patella mobility or is it anything else? Do we think, you know, it's something to do with, um, how it impacts the quad? Does it have to, like, does it affect, um, is it like they have pain and they have quad inhibition, you know, because I think Canis has come, you've come to a lab where we've been in the cadaver lab and you've seen actually how that graph comes out. It's aggressive, you know, when yeah. you sort of look at it, from as an like an outside perspective, like, oh, you're actually like sawing into their patella and, you know, taking a bone block out. Um, so is that sort of pain alone sort of inhibiting their quad and, you know, they're having a harder time doing extension? I think those are all sort of, you know, possibilities. And I think the other, for me, one of the reasons why I don't love it as much in practice that the general talk I give patients is, 
Um, for males and females, I generally offer both quadriceps and patella tendon. And I also do the same for females, but I talk to them, the females a little bit more about anterior knee pain, just because I think with the increased Q angle, there's also like a little bit more, like a lot of women, if you talk to them about their history, you say, did you have anterior knee pain in high school? Did you have anterior knee pain when you're running? You know, and they'd be, yep, yep, yep. You know, so I, I, I'm worried about making that sort of baseline anterior knee pain even worse. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that, either of you. Yeah, I completely agree with you, Catherine. And honestly, I think our poor females, because I feel like, you know, BTB has a risk of anterior knee pain, which is a concern in a population that already has a higher risk of having patellofemoral pain. As you mentioned, the Q angle, they have thinner patellar cartilage, more ligamentous laxity, like the whole, the whole setup for having patellofemoral pain. But we also knew they do not as well with hamstring. ACLs. They have smaller hamstring diameter. They have a higher failure rate. There was a a paper that came out by Salem and colleagues from Rothman Rothman that talked about a significantly increased risk of re-tearing your ACL using hamstrings in females compared to males. And they thought it was due to hamstring size. But even if hamstring size was greater than eight, it still was a higher risk. And I think up until quad came about, we were kind of stuck. You know, you either did hamstring and risked an increased rupture risk, or you did uh, BTB and just told them, sorry, you're probably going to have patellofemoral pain. But now we have the quad graph, which I think is a really good option. It's uh, a soft tissue graft. You, you can take it with a bone plug, but I don't. I do a pure soft tissue graft, which kind of avoids that, as you said, sawing into the kneecap, but is a robust graft that avoids the size issues and uh, some of the hamstring issues that we see in our females. So that's kind of been my approach to my, my female patients. Um, are you, have you had like a similar approach, Catherine? I know you're doing a lot more quads recently. Yeah. I, ultimately I tell them it's their choice. Uh, but yeah. I think, you know, most of them have a history of anterior knee pain or when you're looking on their MRI, they already have some like grade one, two chondromalacia where they're starting to have like some cracks and fissures um, in their patella cartilage. So I think that kind of makes them like, uh, I don't want to sort of poke the bear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Candace, I really had liked, used- yeah. go ahead. No, go ahead. Um, I like how you mentioned Dr. Logan, or I liked how you mentioned Catherine about the lab that we did where you allowed some different physical therapists to come in and kind of see the process. It really opened up my eyes because you are exactly right. The I, I'm seeing individuals coming in two days post-op and I'm seeing the bandages. I'm seeing all of your guys' great work. Uh, and it was very helpful to be able to reflect back on what we saw in that lab and kind of have a little bit more uh, grace and sympathy and empathy for these patients because <laughs> I yes. had a little bit more of an understanding of why they were feeling the way they were feeling. And I used to get so frustrated you know, day two, if an individual came in and their quad wasn't looking as, as good as I want it to, you know, you, you see all kinds of different quads at day two versus day five versus day seven. And it gave me a little bit more leeway for that quad to come back. And some of those bet that bending and extension, because that is very, very intense what you guys are doing in there. Yeah, I know it is. um, So today I had in the same case, it was like an ACL reconstruction with quad, a medial meniscus repair. And then she had a very large um, chondral defect, which she got an osteochondral allograft. And, you know, those people, I just, you know, it's sort of, you're trying to lay crepe and be like, this is going to be a rough 48 hours. You know, like this mm-hmm. is a lot of work in there. And like, if a, if a patient saw it, they would really understand and be like, oh my gosh, no matter, you know, I'm not surprised at her, you know, as far as like drilling all these tunnels and, you know, drilling for the um, cartilage defect. And it's, you know, it's pretty intense yeah. <laughs> for lack of a better word. Catherine and Ashley, I have a question for you guys. So I have my normal spiel day two after an ACL surgery that I'm telling the individual, but you kind of just made it clear that you guys also sounds like maybe you have a spiel that you're giving them. And I'm interested on what it sounds like on your end, you know, preoperatively what you're telling these individuals. I mean, you mentioned that that last patient, you kind of said, look, this is going to be a rough 48 hours. What does that conversation look like um, on the front end? Because I'm interested on what I know what mine looks like, but what is your guys' sounding like? Ashley, you want to go ahead? 
Sure. Yes. I have so many spiels, <laughs> so many monologues that I break into <laughs> at my pre-op visits. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so I basically highlight kind of what you said. It's going to be, a, it's going to be a rough 48 hours, 48 to 72 hours. I spend a good amount of time talking about pain control and how it's a multimodal approach. I do a nerve block, obviously pre-op that lasts about 18 hours post-op. I don't do a femoral block. I do a saphenous block. So it's just pure, you know, sensory. Um, we do obviously a cold cuff. I'm sure you guys do that as well too, which stays on for, you know, 72 hours until we see them back for their first visit. Um, I actually drain all my ACLs at their first post-op. Um, actually, my, my PA, Anna, does, but but we drain the knee um, to lessen that effusion, which I think helps with some of that quad inhibition. Um, and then I do, um, I don't love narcotics, but I do talk about the importance of taking that early on so that you can actually like bend your knee, start working with CPM, make some progress with PT. But also part of my spiel is I hit like I don't know if they're high numbers, but I basically say I want you at 90 degrees by two weeks, 120 by four weeks, and full by six. And that seems really aggressive for patients, but I think it's like shoot for the moon, land among the stars. So I always push them to a point where if they, maybe they're 110, that's okay, but I want them aiming for 120. So I want them aiming by full by six weeks. I want them aiming to run by 12 weeks so that we're like pushing them along. And if they're almost there, but not quite, they're still doing well. So that's usually what I'm telling people. Catherine, what about you? Yeah, I think it's similar. I think we both bring in people for a formal pre-op. Um, that was something I mentioned Dr. Laprod before, but that was something that I thought he did really well. Um, and I tried to replicate my own practice where even if someone is healthy, they are 22 years old, like you're coming in for a full preoperative appointment and they're mm -hmm. probably in the office for about an hour between myself um, and the rest of the staff just kind of going through, you know, I'll be spending a lot of time going through the surgical side. Um, but then, you know, we're going through everything from, you know, what kind of pain medications are we taking, um, going through all of that in pre-op. So you're not sort of, I think a lot of surgeons do that in recovery room. And then it's just, no one's listening in recovery. You just want to get home, you know, mm -hmm. or you're, you know, you've had drugs. Like if you're the patient, yeah. you're definitely not listening. And so we go through all the pain medications, you know, the, if anybody's taking narcotics, we spend a lot of time talking about like stool softener. These are all the side effects. Um, I also write for a muscle relaxer because um, I think that's a nice alternative to a narcotic pain medication because a lot of times with the quad autographed, it's like you, they're not so much, oh my gosh, my knee is bothering me as much as like my quad or my hip flexor is sort of in spasm. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a nice to have and it sort of also helps them sleep a little bit at night. Um and then we also sort of talk that day, like uh, Ashley said, a lot about icing. And I give the option of people can either rent and get something like a game ready or um, the nice machine, which has like the compression or go ahead and purchase a unit um, that they can have forever. That's just like a cold unit um, and kind of talk through all those sort of things. So there's definitely a lot of sort of preparation sort of for beforehand to say like, this is not easy. You're not going to sort of like day one, feel like a million bucks. Um, and then when I talk to them about graphs, I do spend some time talking about, you know, say you have a cadaver, you're, um, you know, in your forties plus, um, like basically I, I sort of say, if you're under 40, like, and you want a cadaver, like I'm not your surgeon, like you should, you know, but I, you know, I'm going to want you to do an autographed, but if you're sort of over 40 or sort of, and you, and that's the decision for you, you're going to have a better quad contraction. You're going to be doing a straight leg raise faster, but if you do a quad autograph, like that's the downside, you're not going to get a straight leg raise as fast, but you're going to get there. Um, but if you sort of look at somebody at the table next to you and they've had a cadaver graph, they're going to look better than you initially. Um, so just sort of giving them that understanding that it just takes a little time. Yeah, I think that's really important. And you kind of segued nicely into the, the next thing I want to bring up and ask Candace about. So we talked a lot about patellar tendon. We've talked about cadaver tendon, hamstring, and we've kind of danced a little bit around quads. So how do you feel the recovery after a quad ACL compares to, let's say, a patellar tendon ACL? Do you feel like they get stiffer? Do you feel like they have longer duration of quad weakness? Like, What can we tell our patients to expect? Yeah, I think that's a great question. The trend that I tend to see the most in clinic 
it comes with where the pain location is at. So, and the kneeling, like we kind of already targeted. So if I have an individual that is a patellar tendon graft, I know that we are most likely going to struggle with the kneeling. Um, and bending still comes. Like I said, an individual might have 130 degrees, 140 degrees of knee flexion, but they still don't like to kneel on it. And I think it has to do with that sensitivity right on that anterior part of the knee where most of my quad tendon grafts they're going to be having pain kind of at the distal quad, so right above the knee. And that's Mm -hmm. where individuals all the time are coming in. And I like to ask the question, you know, if you have knee pain or if you're going to get any knee pain, where does it tend to bark at the most if you had to point with one finger? And that's one of my very first questions I ask individuals that aren't necessarily my patient, but, you know, they're coming through the door and maybe we're looking at them at a, you know, Um, movement assessment and they're six months out. And almost all of my quad tendon graphs are pointing not at the knee, but they're pointing right where it sounds like that quad tendon is being taken out of their knee, like we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like (laughs) there... I'm embarrassed to say, Ashley, there's a theme here because I recently made Candace take all these videos. (laughs) (laughs) Catherine, I think it's time for you to be in one of these videos. <laughs> no, next time I'm going to have to grab the camera because Catherine's exactly. right. I showed up and she said, all right, let's do some great videos. And we had the stage <laughs> set and she was the director. Exactly. <laughs> camera. <laughs> so, you know, Candace hit it on the head where like there's certain themes that come up all the time. So it's like, and it's usually that balance between I'm increasing my workload and I'm not recovering enough and I'm not dealing with like soft tissue. So it's like my knee joint feels okay. Like I'm not having a lot of issues there, but I'm not taking good care of my soft tissue. So it's like foam rolling, you know, and soft tissue mobility sort of thing. So recently, since this comes up all the time and I was constantly getting down in clinic on a foam roller and being like, this is how you foam roll. You have to do this. You And they would always say to me, do you have a video or, you know, this was always there. And I'd be like, just go on YouTube, get a quad, you know, whatever. It's not that hard, but I wanted to make it really, really easy. So I did ask, but also <laughs> probably forced Candace to make videos um, for me that were basically all the sort of things like quad rolling, you know, IT band, lateral stuff, calf, all that hip flexor mobility. And then um, I put them on my website and then I made a QR code for that page. And now I just have like a little sort of Canva handout that I give people and say, okay, this is what I talked to you about. You're going to go do this QR code. There is going to be a woman named Candace. She is going to <laughs> instruct you through this. <laughs> And so it, it's helped a lot, <laughs> but I would say that is, it's the soft tissue kind of piece that I think, um, you know, you have to kind of deal with after quads. Like if, as people start to get into that heavier strengthening phase, like they're running, they're starting to jump, they're starting to do agility. They start to be like, oh man, I'm tight in there. And they just, they just need a little TLC. Yeah. Catherine, I couldn't agree more. I, Love ACLs because you, not one ACL is the same, but people have very similar journeys, but hit those markers at different times. I can't, I mean, you know, because you are getting my text messages, but so many messages I feel like I send to you about various patients is, you know, okay, so and so is finally round in that corner, was a long corner, but we made it, you know, and then I'll text you about someone else and, okay, well, this person, we're barely approaching that corner. I think we got a long road ahead, but we've arrived. And, what we tend to see most is about that six, eight month mark of ACL rehab. Individuals are coming in to do some movement testing and they've been able to start jumping and they've started their return to run program and they are looking forward to ski season. And everybody said nine months, this nine months, that, Mm -hmm. and they are still having that leg pain, whether it's, you know, depending on the graft or where the individual is feeling that pain at, they're feeling pain. And that starts to freak a lot of people out. I feel like about the six to eight month mark is where individuals are coming in and they're like, okay, this didn't work. The surgery didn't work. And we have to really sit them down and explain to them, okay, well, the first 
three months, we were kind of going zero miles an hour to 20 miles an hour. We were mm-hmm. like in a school zone here, especially if they had meniscus involvement, MCL involvement. And then then we, okay, then we got to single leg lifts. Then we got to really loading you. Then we got to jumping. Then we got to impact. Now we're doing running things and people don't account for, okay, now we're out of that school zone. We're on the highway and we kind of need an oil change a little bit. And now's the point where the body, you're not doing too much. I explained to people, we're not overworked. You're under recovered and we have poor tissue. Poor soft tissue quality. We have increased soft tissue restrictions. And it's because of everything that I just mentioned. And I kind of explained to people like, I did this. We did this together. We created that pain in your knee because we've been grinding. And now it's time to back off a little bit. Let's do some foam rolling. Let's do some of the maintenance things. Let's get adequate hip mobility. Let's look above and below your knee joint. And let's kind of take a full body approach. And that's when I can kind of feel those individuals in the office kind of let out a big, okay, (laughs) you're right. It did work. You're right. You're right. And it's kind of nice to see people turn around, but I do feel like I give that pep talk and that just dial. I have that conversation with individuals often right around that six to eight month mark. Yeah. Agree. Or... Their other side looks really crummy. Yes, that is also really a common crummy. conversation. Like you do a single leg, you know, squat on their other side, and you're like, "Yeah, you can't <laughs> keep ignoring working out on your good leg." You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> that's the other thing that we see. Yes. Um, okay, so I think before we get too ahead of ourselves, the other thing we want to look about, um, look into a little bit, is extension deficit. Because that's sort of the one thing, that's the thing when we were talking about what's your sort of talk that you give people, that's the thing that I try and scare them the most and sort of say, look, if you ever have trouble with your flexion, I don't want you to have trouble with your bending, but I have a bailout. We'll be right back. We are supported by SportsMed IQ, where you can find all the tools you need to be your best in sports medicine and recovery. Go to sportsmediq.com to access blogs and a weekly newsletter highlighting the latest research and trends to care and injury prevention, treatment, and recovery. You also find links to each of our podcast episodes, access to educational courses, and links to our favorite products. I created this site to house all that I've learned over the last two decades as an orthopedic surgeon, physical therapist, and personal trainer. So check out sportsmediq.com for all your sports medicine needs. And we're back. If you have trouble with your extension, you don't always have a really great bailout. So especially if their other side is like way hyperextended and they only get to like perfectly neutral or say they're like a positive two or three degrees, that feels like a total crazy difference to them side to side. So I think, you know, what are your tips and tricks, Candace, for like avoiding that extension deficit? Yeah. I'm so happy, Catherine, that you mentioned that that is a big part of your prehab spiel because it is um, imperative, right? It's also a big part of my spiel. I let people know that after surgery, we have three priorities. First priority is pain management. And the second priority, and then I kind of go into a big spiel about that. And then the second priority is mobility. And within mobility, there is a hierarchy. One is much, much more important than the other. And that is straightening. And I make sure that if my patient knows anything, because day one, you're really giving them a lot of info. Sometimes they're just almost like a deer in headlights. But if they know anything at all, it is that we must get extension back. And that I tell them that is the ability to lay your leg all the way flat completely. I let them know no pillows. That's another big thing. And sometimes people freak out because they've already, it's day two, maybe day five, and they've already been using a pillow and their eyes get real big and they look at their mom or their significant other that they're there with and they go, oh no, I got to get rid of that pillow. Yeah. And I tell individuals the way we are going to get full range extension is we are going to work on it for 60 total minutes a day not consecutively because eyes get real big there as well. I tell them for about one to two minutes at a time, but at the end of the day, you have actively worked on getting this leg straight for 60 
total minutes. And what that looks like to me is while they're laying down or sitting up even, we prop up that heel on a like a foam roller or a towel. So gravity is actively working on straightening that leg for a total of 60 minutes. And I don't even let people do it for longer than five minutes at a time. I had one individual, we were kind of down to 30 minutes a day. She was a little bit further out and she'd come in every day and it'd be bent. And I'm like, what, what are you doing? Why is your knee bent? And she said, no, I'm 30 minutes a day. I'm doing it. And I was like, no, you're not. I know you're not doing it. And she said, yes, I am. And I'm like, explain it to me then. Tell me exactly how you're doing it. And she said that she just did three sets of 10 minutes where at that point in time, you're just letting, you're just guarding too much. So that is why, because of her, I now have a rule that you're not doing it any longer than five minutes at a time. We start off with one to two minutes and cumulatively at the end of the day, it adds up to 60 total minutes. And I tell them, and I mean this in the nicest way possible, this is the one thing I don't care if it hurts. I care then I tell them, but I know it's going to hurt. And I just let them know that. And I really reiterate that the reason that that is the most important is because we know that studies show individuals that do not get a full straight knee are those individuals that are back in the clinic a year after surgery, two years after surgery, because they still have things wrong. And that's I, I scare them. I purposefully scare them, and it is full straightening at all cost. No. Yep. I couldn't agree more with both of you guys. I also scare my patients, and I tell them we have a narrow window to get back that full extension. Like once you're reaching like eight weeks, ten weeks, you're starting to get worried, and then it becomes less and less likely that you're going to get that back. Um, and I also like that you say multiple times a day for shorter intervals because I've had patients where they do like 60 minutes, but they do it in the morning and then that's it. And then they see me the next day in clinic and they're like, but I swear I stretched. I'm like, it's been 24 hours since you stretched your knee. Like everything is retightened back up. And so I tell them it's more the frequency that they're doing it rather than the total duration of time. But I like setting a good amount of time so they do their homework. Um, I have a question uh, for you, Candice. So if someone is, um, I, I operate on a lot of females and a lot of times they'll have some ligament laxity um, and I have some patients that hyperextend five degrees, maybe even more. Um, do you attempt to get them back to their hyperextension or do you, are you just wanting to get them back to neutral? Obviously we don't want them plus, but do you want them to get back to hyperextension given that hyperextension in some respects can contribute to a higher risk of, of injury in general? Um, but it would also have them match their non-operative side. How far do you push them? Yeah, Ashley, that is a great question. I do not want to overly promote excessive hyperextension. A lot of times if those individuals are in the clinic, that gives me somewhat, depending on if it was contact or non-contact injury, somewhat of a clue perhaps of how they were maybe predisposed to this injury in the first place. And I don't want to set them up post-operatively to once again pre- get be predisposed to the same injury that they just suffered. But we are definitely going to get extension back plus a couple degrees. But if someone is very, very lax, um, my goal is to not mirror the other side, but to create a healthy level of uh, extension there and not necessarily need to have exact, uh, ex- excuse me, do not necessarily need to have exact symmetry. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Sports Docs. We hope you enjoyed the first part of our discussion as much as we did. On the next episode, we'll continue our conversation with Candace Townley-Cox and shift our focus from ACL specifics to recovery of quad function and lower extremity mobility. Make sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on all things sports medicine. If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a review. You can also reach us by email at thesportsdocspod at gmail.com or find us on Instagram at thesportsdocspod. We love your feedback.